Well, we're listening to the Sean Harrison trial, pastor accused of shooting an individual. We're listening to John Green, the audio visual forensic expert. There's going to be a little tedious testimony here as the prosecutor tries to cue this up so that the evidence is missable before the jury. But we may actually be watching at the end of him qualifying this expert in order to produce this video to the jury of a potential capturing of some part, obviously, of the crime scene, maybe the shooting itself. Uh, we're not really sure right now, but that's what's happening now. The prosecutor prosecutor is qualifying him. He's got lots of video, lots of data. The prosecutor's office and the police did a great job right now. What you're seeing on your screen um, are the locations, a map in the middle for our serious XM listeners, and various uh, photographs of individuals and the camera shots. Let's go back to the testimony. Let's start with um, 18 Palm Pay Street. Um, there's an arrow from 18 Palm Pay Street to up to the right-hand corner here on That's the screen. Correct. Uh, what are those pictures of? Those are pictures uh, of the camera placement at uh, Pompeii Street that um, show an individual um, uh, walking on the sidewalk. Um, that in my master composite is the beginning of my particular video that I assembled in this case. And what was the next video that you used to compile your master composite? Um, well, I'd have to actually see <laughs> the uh, there. There are 23 separate cuts in the in the video itself, so okay. I would have to really see the uh, the video in action, uh, where I do so many different videos. Uh, I would be able to look at it here. All right, let's start off with this. Uh, what's been uh, addressed or labeled as Harrison Master Video? Did you mm -hmm. create this, sir? I did. And you created uh, 23 different clips of video, is that correct? I did. In a uh, it's somewhat chronological order? They are. There are 23 clips. Uh, some of them are repetitious, but it, it uh, uh, the repetition uh, of the uh, particular clip shows something else going on in that same view. And starting off with <clears throat> here, this is 18 Palm Pastry, is that correct? That's correct. Right. And that correlates with just, I'm going to do this once, but not think that particular clip came from the video out of 18 Pompeii Street folder in the videos organized correct it did <clears throat> oh, that's All right. and that had a different proprietary software that you had to based upon your training uh, tr trans or put into a format that you could mold into one video that's all of one format. Right. What I did with each and every one of these videos in order to maintain um, consistency, you know, from each capture, uh, what I did was I screen captured everything. I have a special screen capture device at my forensic workstation back at the office. We have special software, special devices uh, to accurately uh, capture all these images. Uh, and Then it allows me to save it in a um, a uniform uh, setting and then assemble everything. Well, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. What we're looking at right now for our listeners is pictures, just random pictures of video clips that are playing. There's not any explanation, at least at this point in time. Uh, that could be a good prosecutorial uh, idea. We'll see. In the Sean Harrison trial, this is a trial where a person who is a reverend, uh, supposedly, and an educator is accused of having shooting a boy in the head at the school at which he was a teacher uh, because of a drug deal, whether he was part of a gang. We're, we're just looking at right now random clips of people walking down the street. They're a little fuzzy, pixelated. Um, you see different colors. 
colors. It's really hard to identify the people. Again, there's no testimony being uh, going on right now. That's why we're talking about it. And um, I, it, it could be a technique of the prosecutor to show the whole thing first and then to back up and show frame by frame in order to do what it is that they're attempting to do with the expert, John Green. That's the prosecution's expert trained by the FBI. He's an audiovisual forensic expert. At this time, I want to bring in Charles Middlestadt. He is a criminal forensic, uh, criminal defense expert. Ex I'm sorry, investigator. Uh, he's from Atlanta. I should know this. I use criminal investigators all the time. So, Charles, uh, let me ask you: What are you seeing so far? And these videos are based on this testimony. How do you think it's going to fit in here in the prosecution's case? You know, Bob, it's it's super interesting. So apparently, in this case, they have a a ton of different video sources that they're pulling from along this route and um, but the thing that they're teeing up is they, they've made a collage, they've made a movie in this case. Uh, clearly the defense would have been provided with all the raw footage and uh, would have had a chance to examine that as part of their discovery but what the ultimately what the prosecution wants to do is they don't want to uh, overburden the jury with all this raw footage that's disconnected. That's not going to make a lot of sense. They're going to want to tie it together into a nice, neat movie. Uh, the thing that, in the process of doing that, though, Bob, they're, they kind of open themselves up to a lot of challenges with regard to their methods and, and video degradation. And when you take things out of context, um, I think they open themselves up to some challenges in doing so. What we've seen of the video so far is... Um, it's grainy, and they've talked about this. John Green has talked about how he has an expertise in looking for certain uh, identifying features in order to be able to try to make a positive identification, which would suggest to me that there that there's not going to be anything that's so compelling that perhaps the jury's just going to immediately uh, uh, recognize uh, the individual in, in this uh, in this video montage to be the defendant, and so they're um, trying to tee up this. Uh, John Green as an expert who is uniquely qualified to uh, assist in making that identification. But of the video that we've seen so far, it's, it's pretty grainy. Yeah, and for our serious XM viewers, what we're seeing right now are various cars passing by, as Charles indicates. It is grainy. But, Charles, there were a couple of videos that were shown. And, again, we just don't know how relevant each of these videos is to the prosecutor because we're seeing them, as they say, odd seri items, one after another after right. another without any kind of context. Um, but there were some of some individuals that were actually highly defined, um, and, and I'm curious as to whether those were cleaned up, but I agree with your point, and I think it's a good one. When you're trying to segregate these videos as a prosecutor or as a law enforcement expert, you better make sure you're squared away, it's perfectly done, because I've seen these videos blow up because it just wasn't done correctly, and a good defense lawyer could tear them apart. But these look pretty authentic, um, you know, to me. So what do, you, what do you think? Are they going for the ID? Is it a mistake? Stake, do you think to use this when they've had such powerful victim testimony? I, I think they have to go for the ID, Bob. I mean, here this is a case that's made up of uh, a few key components. One is going to be the ID by the victim himself, right, who positively identifies um, uh, the reverend as the shooter. Uh, and then they've uh, the, the video would be in this in the CSI age that we live in now. The jury is going to knowing that there's some video now that there's video that's involved as part of the prosecution's uh, case in chief. Uh, it, it better have some value, better have some weight to it, other than just showing a couple of figures walking down a, uh, on a dark snowy night, right? So. Um, I, I would sense that my sense would be that they they do at some point have to uh, hope that the jury is left with the impression uh, uh, that this is in fact the defendant who appears in um, in this video montage. The challenge I see is it's unusual, frankly. Uh, it's rare that you see a case where you have that many different sources of video. Yeah, it listen seems to like I'm oh, sorry. It, it seems like because of maybe the, the length of the route of travel that was taken uh, on foot, that there were a number of businesses along the, the way, but the, there's a, over a dozen different uh, video sources, each uh, separate independent capabilities, each different levels of quality, um, different sort of resolution, lighting. Yeah, uh, so uh, it's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. There, there's an awful lot here. Just so our, our, view, our viewers and listeners uh, understand what's happening now, again, we're just seeing random clips uh, some pixelated, some not, of cars driving by. 
Um, and I guess th these were all put together, as, as Charles indicates, in a kind of montage that hopefully at the end will make some sense. Um, listen, I'm asking the viewers, as you guys know, I love to answer your questions. Charles, there, there were four questions that I've identified that need to be answered. I, I think that you heard some of the victim's testimony in this, and I kind of want to jump back to it while we're just watching these random videos right now, really, of no activity at all. Sure. And um, let, let's go to minor fourth and one juror matters, because they essentially had the same question, and I think it's a good one. Now, there are serious questions that the, these uh, viewers on Law and Crime Network that, and asked, and then really serious ones. These are okay. the serious ones. Uh, is there any motive for the victim to lie as to who shot him? And one juror matters actually said something that we were laughing about off camera. Santa has a bag of weed and toys. We were, we were talking about how he looked like a Santa <laughs> without the outfit on. But right. do you think that, is that a compelling, a compelling statement that why would a person lie about who it was that actually shot them? Sure. There, there absolutely could be other reasons. I mean, you may want to frame somebody else because maybe your life has been threatened. And so, um, and, and we also know that the, the allegation in this case revolves around some sort of uh, drug conspiracy, right? I mean, this is an allegation where you have this student coordinator, this reverend who was a uh, anti-drug, anti-gun activist, uh, and uh, so, sort of a youth pastor, mm -hmm. but who has, uh, it appears, at least the prosecution's theory, is that he's surrounded himself and advantaged his position uh, as a, an administrator to recruit some of these students for for the very purpose of transacting for selling um, drugs. So anytime you have a drug conspiracy, uh, testimony, um, uh, pressure, uh, extortion, uh, threats to life, all of these components have the potential to play some role in that. And I think, you know, that's certainly that the defense could argue is that if they're taking the position that there's, first of all, it's a bad ID, that the, the video itself ultimately is not going to provide the jury with any clarity with regard to uh, a positive ID on the defendant, then they have to argue these other things. You just heard earlier from the, uh, from the law enforcement expert, uh, Feeney, about uh, when he was cross-examined, and clearly the defense is trying to uh, get to the point where they're, yes, they have these things in their client's home, but it's more, it's not intent, right? It's possession. And so they're pushing it towards the possession side. So of Charles, things. so Charles, my thought of this is that, and by the way, for the viewers uh, and the listeners, what we're looking at again are just random pixelated pictures right now of a parking lot with a car in it. Um, we're in the Sean Harrison trial, a supposed... Actually, we see somebody running on the video, so it, I don't know if there's any testimony in court. Our great producers... Okay, so there's no testimony going on, but we just saw, we see people running now in the video, and it, it's it, around the time of the shooting, there was one person running in one direction, another person running in, in an, another direction. Um, so you definitely see some activity on this uh, video. And it's my opinion, Charles, that what the prosecutor is going to do is loop the testimony of the victim by this video. The video doesn't have to be absolutely conclusive, but what, and we see now another another angle of an individual running um, down the street, and now we see another angle. We don't know if this is the same individual or different individuals walking very quickly down a snowy street with a little uh, pathway cut between a lot of high snow. So we definitely see a video with a lot of activity. Now, um, for those who are listening, we see an, another video of a person going towards or inside of a building. So I think the courtroom is back testimony. We saw it right at the end. Let's get back to the courtroom and, and hear what we saw. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. Don't worry, there's nothing being testified to in court right now to our serious XM listeners. It's great to have you on board. We just looked at some, I think, pretty compelling, even though it was pixelated, a little grainy. But we see at the end of those videos that were compiled, a lot of activity going on, and at least a person, potentially more, because there's so many video cameras. I think the prosecution is using us to loop in the victim's testimony, as well as the drugs and the gun and the other evidence, cash that were found in the pastor, quote unquote, home, in order to just use it as a piece of evidence, maybe not necessarily a definitive piece of evidence. Charles, what are your thoughts about um, what you saw right at the very end of that? With We went through a couple of minutes of almost virtually nothing, and then bam, we have all this activity. Yeah, that potentially is the victim. That looked like, to, to me, it looked to be a, a younger man there, Bob. And so, I, and I, by the way, I absolutely agree okay. with you. I'm sorry to cut you off. Let's listen in because they're back to testimony.
Okay, we just got done listening to the examination and cross-examination of John Green, an FBI-trained audio-visual forensic expert who showed a montage of videos and then tried to attempted to try to show that what we saw on the video, which could have captured the actual shooting, matched the clothing uh, to the defendant. At least that's the uh, the, the uh, prosecution's argument. Um, but Charles Middlestadt, uh, who is a criminal defense investigator, he's actually on the other side of this, preparing cases for defense attorneys who would actually be bringing cases to court. I said that there were two extremely uh, two important questions we read to from the viewers. But there was also two extremely important questions. They come from BB314 and Bone7616. I have to mention them because both of them asked the same kind of question. I don't get it. BB314 is asking me if I make good ragu. I don't know, Charles, why did I ask a guy with a vowel at the end of his name that question? But Bones7616 asked whether it's, uh, I make a good gravy. Listen, yes, I make a great gravy. Not sauce. It's gravy, not sauce. Listen, right. we're, Charles, real quick, give me 15 seconds or less. What would you think of the ultimate testimony? I don't think the defense touched them. No, I was shocked at the cross-examination. I mean, there were so many other things that they should have explored. I mean, I was shocked when he sat down. It's unbelievable. Okay. Well, listen, we're going to talk about that on the other end. We're going to do a real quick break, and we're going to come back to this case right after the break. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network and to our Sirius XM listeners. Charles, I'm really glad I got that gravy ragu thing, those two questions asked. But perhaps more important than that relevant subject was the testimony of this particular forensic expert. Just before we took a break, real quick, I had to cut you off in the middle of the answer, but so that our viewers know, we're talking about Massachusetts versus the Sean Harrison case. Is this pastor, reverend, anti-gang guy, anti-drug guy, accused of actually dealing drugs, actually using using juveniles or young people in the actual uh, distribution model and actually shooting and uh, almost killing. He's on trial for attempted murder in Massachusetts. We saw a video that the prosecution is purporting where the two of those individuals, both uh, the defendant that you see on the screen right now, the quote unquote reverend, as well as the victim, um, you were in the process of saying you didn't think the defense did a, a, a necessarily great bang up job on cross. Can you explain that a little more to us? Well, uh, you know, Bob, this is potentially some very, very damaging evidence. I mean, this is evidence that I think the jury is really going to study. Um, and this uh, John Green was, uh, you know, very good at uh, explaining his methodology and as an expert in terms of explaining why he was looking for certain identifying features in order to try to match them up. Now, I guarantee you there's some very, um, you know, diligent jurors that were taking copious notes that if that if the video goes back, with them, they're going to be looking for those things. And so I think it was really necessary, given that possibility of, the, of this being uh, pretty compelling evidence, to really challenge some of the things that John Green, some of the assertions that he made. He kind of started to touch on it, like, listen, aren't there other jackets out there that would have another emblem and that sort of thing? But I would have gone through very methodically from the collection. He actually had them uh, almost tripped him up. He started to trip him up, but never pursued it with regard to uh, the location of a camera. And it sounded like Green wasn't certain that his ac his information was accurate. But then he let him off the hook. Let Some of this footage looks like it may not even be digital in nature, Bob. Some of it may actually be really old um, video footage, which means that there's tremendous degradation, especially in the transfer process. There's a lot to work with here on a on a cross uh, side. Yeah, Charles, let me ask you, was it your impression or interpretation of what was being shown in these videos that this was, in fact, a defendant? We see actually on the video right now two people walking in one direction. Uh, I'm just going to try to narrate this a little bit for our listeners. It's snowy out. It's by a parking lot. They're walking uh, very close with one another. You see some kind of quick activity going on, and then... Uh, eventually you're going to see this individual come and turn now here you go and he's running now in the opposite direction is it your impression that the the prosecution is saying there's the shooting there's the defendant there's the victim that that seems to be the case and ultimately you know they're going to use I suspect use this video montage um, and allow the victim to get on the stand and narrate it and in, in fact that's where the shooting occurred and there's some biological evidence or some blood or some other evidence at that spot then it, it conclusively uh, demonstrates that that's where it happened. There were two individuals 
Um, it, it corroborates the victim's version of the events. And then at that point, it's just a matter of the jury trying to determine whether, in fact, they believe that the other individual in this, they'll, they'll be convinced that the one individual is certainly the victim, right? That this can't be some sort of coincidence that this video just lines up like that and that the, the prosecution just gathered all this on the, on the street and then put it together. Um, so the, the, the next thing is, is this the defendant in the case? And they've kind of, at this point, the way the, the, the lack of any thorough cross and, and piercing cross-examination has left uh, it really up to the jury to look at this and, and form their own conclusion without a lot of challenge from the defense in this case. And I think that was, that was a mistake. Yeah, but, you know, Charles, it also is consistent with what the victim was saying, that, that there didn't seem to be a problem. They were unaware of any kind of problem. They do appear to be casually walking down the street. And, and I think your point is very, very well taken about the forensics. I really love the point you made off air, but you just made it on air. It, it would be somewhat unusual as a trial tactic, not unheard of, to have the victim testify then have the law enforcement officer or, or, or expert authenticate the tapes, explain the tapes. There was really no serious cross-examination. And it will be interesting to see whether or not the prosecution recalls the victim and asks the victim to narrate the case, because I'll get your opinion on that in a minute. But we always, as lawyers, want to be able to loop our testimony over and over again in the most compelling way, and that's a compelling piece of evidence. Do you think they're going to put the victim back on? I would, in my opinion, that would certainly be the most compelling way to flush out that evidence, to connect the dots for the jury, and to have the, the, the victim himself, who is best positioned out of anybody in this case, to narrate this video and to help the jury understand what was going on, what the conversation was, how it is they came to be walking on that street together, the context of that interaction between the two of them, and then his supposed shock at being shot, and then the, the defendant taking flight. So I, I can't imagine who would be better positioned to do that than the victim himself. Right. So, I mean, actually, listen, I'm just looking at one of the comments, and I'm curious about this from one of our viewers, Baltimore Joe, and it's, um, I hope it doesn't go too quickly here, but it says, you, Bob, Prost doesn't need to ID Reverend via video, only that he is walking side by side, and that bolsters the victim ID of Reverend. Had it not been for this video, defendant could claim the video showing the shooting um, that the shooter snuck up and wasn't seen by the victim. What do you think about that? I think it's a pretty astute comment. I agree. I don't think, not only do I not think they're not going to be able to get a, a, you know, a conclusive positive ID based upon the grainy footage, but I, I agree. I don't think it's necessary. It really becomes almost a, a kind of a circumstantial piece of evidence in the case to show, look, this, is, this corroborates exactly what the victim is saying, and um, his testimony is reliable, and there would be no other reason for him to finger anybody else um, uh, clearly, whoever he was walking with, he knew they were walking side by side for, for some period of time. So Can't then the jury would be left with the impression or, or with the question, why would he possibly implicate, implicate somebody else in this? Right. Okay, Charles, listen, I really appreciate that. My, my producers are awesome here telling me that we're going to take a clip real quick to the drug control unit. And on the other side of that, I want to ask you some thoughts about that as well. Great. Okay, we're at the Massachusetts versus Sean Harrison case, the case where a pastor, alleged pastor, reverend, school administrator is accused of being potentially a drug dealer and or shooting a young man as a result of a drug transaction gone bad that is alleged to have actually employed that young man in a drug distribution scheme. What you're seeing right now is what we call a classic expert on narcotics and giving the juror their expert opinion as to what narcotic distribution looks like, i.e. the difference between possession and possession with the intent to distribute. Right now I'm here with Charles Middlestadt um, from Atlanta. He's a criminal defense investigator. And we looked at, I stopped that clip specifically and asked the producers to do it. I'm curious what you folks think online for our serious XM uh, listeners. 
when you just so you know for the the listeners this bag charles was i i guess about two feet by two feet by two feet it was a huge bag filled uh, with what has been tested to be marijuana and it, it's such a powerful piece of demonstrative evidence in front of the jury I personally, as a prosecutor, would have played with that bag and that marijuana and asked to publish it to the jury, because you know from your training and experience that when you have a bag with that much, it smells in the courtroom. It's got a very distinct odor. It's a very powerful piece of demonstrative evidence. But I mean, is there going to be a juror in that jury box that's going to think that that is for personal use? That's a, that's a high hurdle to overcome um, to try to defend the presence of a, a quantity, that sort of quantity uh, for personal possession. But at the same time, though, Bob, you know, the, the prosecution has a high hurdle to overcome based upon the fact that this reverend is well known to the community, he's well respected, he's in, been involved over the past few years uh, in different initiatives, anti-gun, anti-gang um, initiatives. So he has these accomplishments that I think the, the prosecution realizes is going to make it difficult for the jury just to accept that this guy could have gone rogue uh, like this in spite of the fact that he has all these other um, accomplishments and feathers in his cap. So, you know, there, there's high hurdles on both sides, but that's a tough one to explain away. <laughs> well, that's the criminal defense investigator coming at you, and I appreciate that perspective because you are right. There's a lot of quote unquote credibility with law. He worked even in conjunction with police departments, anti gang and anti gun and uh, anger management counseling. But the bottom line is you got a ton of weed in your house with gun and cash, and you're walking down the street allegedly with a guy who it's winds up weed. with a bullet in his head. So I yeah. think I think the hurdle is is a uh, is a mountain too high even for the reverend to uh, you know overcome in this scenario. So listen, uh, folks, we are going to take a uh, quick break, and on the other end of this, we're going to continue to discuss the Massachusetts versus Sean Harrison case. Again, this Boston pastor educator who's accused of actually soliciting young people to deal with drugs and actually shooting a man in the head charged with attempted murder because amazingly, and boy, Charles, we've seen this before. I say this all the time. It's crazy. Shot him in the head and he lived and is actually testifying as a witness against this quote-unquote pastor. So we're going to throw to the break, and on the other end of that, we're going to come back with some more law and crime. Yeah, we're back with the Sean Harrison trial. I'm here with Charles Middlestat. We're talking uh, criminal defense investigator about the testimony of William Feeney, who was an expert presented by the prosecution, very common in a drug-related case, who is allowed to... And, and Charles, let's talk a little, a little bit about this so that our viewers and our listeners, Sirius XM listeners, understand. This is a case where a pastor is accused over drug-related activity of having shot and attempted to kill because the victim actually lived and was testifying in court. And this all surrounds a drug slash potential gang related uh, issue. And you had indicated that obviously he comes with a lot of credibility, at least prior to all of this. This forensic um, expert is testifying about his opinion. And in a court, uh, I'm sorry, in a court, these gentlemen are allowed to tell you, based upon their training and their experience, they're allowed to do more than just facts, what they saw, what they heard, what they smelled, what they tasted. They're allowed to actually offer an opinion. And the defense attorney has an opportunity to then cross-examine that opinion based upon the facts that were relied upon in that expert in coming to the opinion. Now, I've handled and seen um, drug experts like this be cross-examined um, by some of the best in the business. I was a little surprised that there wasn't a little bit more of an aggressive cross-examination because he did give some sweeping general conclusions, although the defense may have said, as we were talking just prior to the break, um, geez, maybe I just need to get out of this because that bag, a huge suitcase-like bag of marijuana is just too powerful to overcome, and it came from my client's house. Sometimes when you stand well, stand still, get out. What do you think? I, I couldn't agree with you more, Bob. I mean, I think they they may have decided there's just uh, the potential uh, for more damage could be done if they go in further. They did plant this seed and this notion based upon that ledger, if you recall, that, in fact, uh, you know, that, that the defendant was a user and, and he was actually a buyer who, whose name appeared uh, on that ledger itself. And I think that's going to be part of the defense 
Maybe they're going to argue that he was just holding or holding the, the weed for somebody. Uh, maybe he was unaware that it was even in there. You got people coming and going. They may argue an issue of access with regard to who may have had access to his house. Mm -hmm. I mean, here he is. He's a student coordinator. He becomes, um, he's a youth uh, organizer coordinator. He becomes, um, you know, friendly and familiar with a lot of youth and maybe they had a free reign of his house as well and he knows nothing about the drugs that were present there so not sure exactly which way they're going to go but they certainly have some options for arguing now who knows how compelling it's going to be but uh, uh you can you can kind of see which direction they're going to be going with their with their closing argument on this. those those are all good points and when we would be investigating these drug cases and there would be a significant quantity of drugs in people's homes we will often talk about this charles that the prosecution side or the lawyer side would always want more evidence we'd want forensic evidence attaching those drugs to the person fingerprint evidence something that showed that they exercised dominion and control over that and to avoid or to block the very arguments you're making that it may have been a plant or somebody may have put it there and this is just an unwitting person now obviously the drugs in his home uh, is a significant piece of evidence for the prosecution but let's not forget and for our, our listeners XM listeners and for our crime uh, long crime followers you know as well as I do at the end of this case the judge is going to instruct them that they can find the person not guilty for a lack of evidence or failure of the state to have done something that you would have expected that they've done so maybe the defense does have an expert that they're going to put forward and so they didn't really need to go after this guy or maybe they're just going to say the prosecution didn't tie it up tight enough for him and I just want to say one last thing Charles I think you made a great point I was confused I'm curious as to how our viewers see this why was a name Sean now it could be a different Sean in that ledger that would have appeared to have made him a purchaser did you see it that way I, well uh, you know fortunately for him it's the same spelling if it's not him I mean Sean can be spelled a few different ways so he may have had the good fortune of uh, <clears throat> excuse me of having another Sean out there but you know, and he, he's also had some other good fortune, too, by the way, Bob. You know, originally this case, uh, he had some co-defendants, and uh, three of those got kicked out because of a bad, a bad stop and a bad frisk. So um, the, the case may be as good as it could be for him at this point. Um, and uh, this may be a lucky break, or maybe he is just a user. Who knows? But the, there's certainly some wiggle room there for the defense to argue. Yeah, and no, I, all great points, Charles. I agree with you. There, it, the process, again, the defense lawyer may be just teeing up little pieces here and there in order to strike that reasonable doubt defense in summation. And there are some kind of wobbly things. That's why I think it was so important for the prosecution to show that video and hope that it convinced the jurors that it was the defendant that was actually shooting the victim, because obviously if they they believe that that's the end of the story uh, we're gonna go back to uh, mr. Feeney's testimony because he's going to talk to you a little bit about what he saw in the house that led to his expert opinion and Charles on the other end of that I'm going to talk to you about what you typically do see that was not found inside the house of a drug dealer great Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. Uh, myself and Charles are trying to break down some, some questions that we were having while we were watching that testimony from Mr. Feeney. Just so you understand that testimony, it is in relation to the Sean Harrison case. This is the defendant on trial at Massachusetts for a 2015 shooting of a young man where he shot him in the head. The man, young man survived actually testified against him on his attempted murder charge and this was all surrounding this person this defendant mr harrison who had a reputation in the community of being a community leader a quote-unquote pastor reverend a person who worked at the school but the prosecution's argument is it was really a jekyll and hyde it was a person who was really behind the scenes dealing with young people in a drug distribution scheme. The expert that we're listening to is actually talking about the nuances and giving his opinion about the items that were found inside of Mr. Harrison's home, which included significant quantities of marijuana, scales, packaging materials, and things that would be consistent that those drugs that were found were for the intent to distribute and or distribution as opposed to ordinary possession, not to mention a ledger and and um, I don't know, you know, Charles, how do we explain this thing? Like good week, bad week, uh, numbers all over it. I mean, that's certainly incriminating to find inside of the defendant's home. 
if it, do we know that that was found inside the, the defendant's home, Bob? Do we know the source of that? I mean, if it was, then that seems uh, like something that's very, very difficult to defend, obviously. I mean, you have all these things, uh, but the one thing that we don't have, and we just heard this on cross, and it's, it's uh, a significant part of the defense's cross, is, you know, what would you typically expect uh, a drug dealer to have in large quantities in his or her home? And that's cash, right? Where's the cash? Right. Well, they, you know, they did find some cash. And what was interesting to me, they found cash in a shoebox. It may not have been in the home, but off-site at a storage facility. Um, but I, I do agree with you that it's, you would have, and they may have done it and not found where that cash went because people launder that cash all the time and find various ways to move that cash around so that law enforcement can't find it. But also the denominations of the cash are very important in drug cases. True. Uh, most drug dealers that are dealing a significant amount of dr drugs are going to have, you know, we used to have these guys coming in trying to say, hey, this is my paycheck, and they got like $5,000 in fives and tens, um, and it just wasn't believable, and it was seen as the uh, an expert like this would testify part of a drug distribution activity. But we don't know the definite answer to that, but one of our viewers uh, had, had actually um, asked this question, and I think it's really important, BB314, as to what exactly are the charges in this case, because it is a little confusing. We have our producers actually working on to see if there's anything more, because me and you were talking off screen about are there drug-related offenses here as part of the charges? But what we do know is that there's armed assault with the intent to murder. That's what most people call attempted murder. Aggravated assault and unlawful possession of a firearm. So it's all of the violent crime pieces to this. Um, so what do you think about that? I mean, I, I, I can't see any reason why they wouldn't have brought drug charges. Maybe they did, but we're trying to find that out right now. Uh, yes, I, I find it super bizarre if, in fact, they didn't bring drug charges. I can only conclude that they, they simply cannot um, make that connection to the possession aspect of it. But other than that, you would fully expect that there would be some sort of drug charge, given that that, based on their theory, is the clear motive, right? This is a, a drug deal gone bad. The victim was working for the defendant in the case. They had some sort of dispute a couple of days before, and it results in uh, the defendant attempting to murder uh, this, this uh, what turns out to be a very, very fortunate victim for right. having survived that attack. But, but yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense. You know, as a defense lawyer myself now, and, and actually some folks were asking online, what, what is it, are you a prosecutor or a defense lawyer? And just so you know, I was an assistant prosecutor for years. I became a defense lawyer for 12 years after that. I became the head prosecutor of my county for six years after that. And now I'm back doing criminal defense work. And I'm trying to say, and, and with all that background and, and my frenetic way of going back and forth between these aisles, what would I as a defense attorney be doing? And you mentioned it before. I would be going for the reputational evidence, the guy's background, the the fact that he had uh, such regard by everybody in the community and it appears even the police and it'd be very interesting to see whether or not they're going to put a lot of character witnesses on and somehow try to explain that this was just a big mix-up but I think the prosecution's got a lot of evidence but like I always try to say defense lawyers only try to prove a case to one juror and one juror if they don't say guilty it's a hung jury so we're going to take a break right now what we're dealing with is the Sean uh, Massachusetts versus Sean Harrison this is the amazing case pastor quote-unquote um, educator or and or is he a drug dealer and employing young people in drug distribution schemes that ultimately led to the potential or uh, almost the attempted murder shooting a young man in the head that testified against him on the other end of the break we're going to come back and give you more information about this case stand by Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network and to our serious XM listeners. Um, we're dealing with Massachusetts versus Sean Harrison. This is the Boston pastor who had a 2005 incident that's on trial for having attempted to kill a young man allegedly as a result of a drug distribution network scheme. Something went sideways. Actually, another one of our viewers made a very interesting point, and from an evidential, a real technical legal point, so go on BB314. Um, comes out and says, if I were the defense attorney, essentially, I would be screaming and yelling and objecting to the introduction of any drug evidence 
if he's not charged with drug crimes. Now, we're still trying to check that out, and, and if he was, maybe somehow it was separate or segregated, and that is a really good point. That would be called bad character evidence in most cases to admit something that's not part of the case. Here, though, Charles, it's my suspicion uh, that the reason that it would be admitted is it goes certainly to motive or explaining why it was that this whole thing took place. And judges do give discretion for prosecutors to be able to put an incident into context, especially when that incident is disputed. I think it's a very astute question. What are your thoughts? I agree. It is. But, you know, in this case, Bob, I think it, it actually the, the drug presence in this case actually could benefit the defendant because it does give them an ability to argue why this seems like such an odd story, why this is such a departure for a guy who, by all accounts, has led a remarkable life, has done good in the community, has been a, a mentor to all these kids. And it enables the, the defense to argue that perhaps the reverend was too trusting and he provided these young men with maybe too much access, um, too much trust, and he found himself in the middle of something that he didn't even understand. Excellent points, and you've been making them all throughout all this, Charles. I appreciate your criminal defense investigative point of view because it can many times. We've been around the block long enough to know that it looks like something over here, and then when you look at it even from the defense side, you're like, yikes, this is something completely different than what we thought it was originally. So great things, and I think that actually gets us into the next piece of what the prosecutor's doing here. I see building blocks. These witnesses are strategically being placed for a reason because the very next next witness after that expert drug witness that the, the prosecution called was the video audio analyst that actually showed for the prosecution through a compilation of videos various activity of individuals moving around based upon the many camera angles that they had received from various locations and at the very end you see a lot of activity and what did the prosecution try to do here circumstantially you used that term before i know people back up and they get all weirded out and scared about the idea of circumstantial evidence but the judge tells the jury that sometimes circumstantial evidence that is where you have to make an inference it's not direct you have to make an inference from facts can be even more powerful and more compelling than direct evidence. This particular witness, Charles, just let's get your pre-thoughts before we let the viewers and our Sirius XM uh, people who are listening to this uh, back to that videotape. But I believe the prosecution is using this to say, look, here it is. We see this on video and here's our expert in court showing you the clothing of the defendant and these things match. Do you think he's doing it because the prosecutor, because he's concerned that there may be some wobbliness in this case? Well, I think they're not going to leave any stone unturned. And here they have this um, great digital, this, this evidence at their disposal, which absolutely corroborates the victim's version of the events. Really, the only question that the prosecution has to conclusively answer for the jury is who, who the shooter is, right? So uh, there's no reason why they wouldn't use it. And actually, this expert does a good job in explaining his methodology in terms of how he went about compiling this um, sort of uh, this movie basically that he built based upon all the various sources of evidence that that was found out there um, but it's still the central question still is it does he go far enough are some of his uh, conclusions assumptions that he's making and the things that he's basically I think what he's really doing Bob is educating the jury as to what to look for when they look at this video with their own eyes what should they be focused on in terms of trying to make that connection to the physical evidence that they've already have, meaning the, 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 the jacket, the gloves, et cetera. As well as the confirming or supporting or bolstering the victim's testimony in the case. And like you said, and it was a great point, let's see if that victim gets back to explain that video. That would be interesting. But hey, listen, folks, we're listening to the Massachusetts versus Sean Harrison case where a passer slash educator is accused as a result of some drug-related activity of shooting a young man in the head who survived, testified against him. And we're going to show you more testimony from the prosecution's forensic expert that took this video. He showed it, put it all together. Hopefully we'll see the end of it because it's kind of like very pixelated and kind of hard to figure out in the beginning. But at the very end, you're going to see a lot of activity. Question is, does this prove that the defendant shot the victim. Welcome to the Law and Crime Network. 
Uh, um, Charles, listen, we looked at this video. This is the second or third time that we've seen it. Um, it was presented by the prosecution's expert, who is a video audio analyst. And so for our serious XM listeners and for our viewers, we're talking about the case of Massachusetts versus Sean Harrison, a case where an elder uh, pastor and educator, quote unquote, is alleged to have shot and attempted to kill a young man who actually survived and testified in the case. It's a 2015 case. And the question is, is he the lovely pastor and great educator and person that the community he thought that he was a person that worked for anti-gangs, anti-violence, you know, anti-anger uh, manage an anger management guy, or did he lead this double life of being a quote-unquote drug dealer um, and actually shoot somebody in the head? And it's it's really a stark difference. Now, Charles, before we sign off, because we're getting close towards that end, and I appreciate all your expert opinion, but our great Kathy Russin from Long Crime Network and everyone that's here, I mean, it's amazing. I'm having a hard time figuring out what the charges are, but I am confident that if Kathy tells me that this is exactly what the charges are through her sourcing, uh, because it's hard to find online, this is what it is. Are Attempted murder, aggravated assault with a weapon, two unlawful possessions of a weapon, two counts of unlawful possession of ammo, ammunition. To possession of a, fi a firearm during the commission of a felony, unlawful possession of a shotgun, unlawful possession of a rifle. This this pastor educator was, was armed to the teeth. guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, possession of CDS with the intent to distribute. That was the question that we were asking ourselves. How could there that expert be testifying without that charge? Well, apparently, Charles, it's there. There it is. So apparently this this uh, guy, this gun buyback program that he was involved with uh, years ago, it was a personal program that he had set up, yeah. and um, he must have had a few left over. Yeah, right. He's got gun buyback, bring your drugs here, um, you know, right. we'll take care and dispose of well, it all. Storage facility is what he was operating, I think. Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, he's lucky it's not a federal charge because drugs and guns could really escalate yeah. and jack this case yeah. up. Um, fortunately for him, it's, it's in the state court. Not that if he gets convicted of these things, he's not going to serve a very, very lengthy uh, prison sentence. But the testimony of, of what we saw, the two experts, one is the drug expert that's telling them this is essentially a possession with intent to distribute. Here's all sorts of things consistent with drug dealers. This video testimony matching it to the clothing of the defendant, I think was relatively powerful evidence. What are your thoughts? I agree. I mean, it, it's... They're slowly and very methodically building their case, um, you know, just by uh, by introducing and we kind of talked about the, you know, the value of that video, Bob. And the, the fact of the matter is at the end of this, they're in a position to say, look, you saw it with your own eyes on video. Now, you and I know that it's not crystal clear, but they're actually in a position to argue that. And you know, the juries need that these days. They expect that. We see shows, these law and crime shows that are solved. It's a crime that happens and everything's solved in an hour, right? So the jury has this expectation that when they sit in a case that the, the, the prosecution is going to make the decision very easy for them and they're going to provide the smoking gun evidence and they don't necessarily have to pay a lot of attention. And they've come to expect that and it actually has had an adverse effect on prosecutions. Well, I'll tell you, when, when I started prosecuting cases, uh, we were trying murder cases with blood evidence but no DNA, no significant forensic. We used to just do it by old-fashioned common sense and building, building cases together. I do agree with you when people are watching this that prosecutors, we find ourselves many times in front of a jury saying, this is not one of these crime shows. It will not be solved because somebody looks at a piece of dirt and says, oh, my God, Joe did it. It won't right. be over in half an hour. It's a sloppy process. But we do have to actually address that when we never had to before. Um, so I, th I think that's a point very, very well taken. So final thoughts, comments, today's testimony. Was it a prosecution day or a defense day? Oh, I, I, based upon the cross-examinations that I saw. Listen, first of all, any time that the case, it's, when the state is presenting their case in chief, it ought to be the prosecution's day every day, right? If the defense is scoring points on their witnesses, then that's a bad day for the prosecution. I didn't really see that with either one of the witnesses that we watched in the last couple of hours, uh, neither uh, William Feeney or John Green. The, the cross-examinations were actually rather limited, as we've, as we've commented on, and uh, not a lot of points were scored. So, in my opinion, it's, it's clearly a prosecution day. You know, listen, I agree with you, but as a paranoid prosecutor on trial, 
I'm always saying to myself, will the jury just find something like in that video that they're going to say, why didn't we know definitively from it? Listen, folks, it is towards the end. I want you to have a happy and safe Memorial Day. Long Crime Network, Sirius XM viewers, thanks for watching. We'll be back shortly. Thank you.